Good morning. Happy New Year. Good morning. Good morning. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thank you. We're glad y'all are here on this uh, Sunday that marks the beginning of a new year. We are able to worship together, which is a blessing to start this new year in community and making a commitment to one another and to God on this day. Um, Just a note, um, our screens are fine. We're just not using them today to give our people that make slides a break because that's a lot of work for them. And so just giving them a break from having to do that um, today. And so everything you need will be in your bulletin or in the hymnal. And we are doing a special service today. You'll hear a little bit more about it later, but called a covenant renewal service, which is a service that was written by the founder of Methodism, John Wesley, that's often done during New Year or on New Year's Day, that reminds us to make a covenant with God or to renew our covenant with God, to renew our commitment to who God calls us to be and to remember that God has already made covenant with us to love us to forgive us, to offer us grace. So there will be um, a lot of uh, call and response um, later on in the service as we make those commitments to God with one another. Um, Something beautiful, I think, about gathering together as a church is that um, we, of course, make our commitments to God as individuals, but we do that in community, and that helps us to hold one another accountable. So we'll start with the greeting, and then we will begin with our music. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. You are the one true God who reigns forever. Let us sing. Would you please please turn to hymn number 383? We'll sing at the degree of new beginnings. So please turn to hymn number 606. We will sing, Come Let Us Be for Grace Divine. This is um, hopefully a familiar hymn tune, even if the words are not familiar. So hopefully you'll pick up on that. So please stand and sing.
we would. And if the children would come forward, we have a special message for you this morning. doing this morning. Happy New Year. Glad y'all are here. So I wonder, do any of y'all know how to drive? No? Hmm. Well, how do you get somewhere when you need to go somewhere? Does someone else drive you? Yes? No one? Oh, that's true. Uh, Do your uh, parents and grandparents drive you places sometimes? And how do they know where they're going? Yeah. (laughs) They are smart. That is true. And sometimes if they don't know where they're going, do they ask for help? Do they use their phone? How do they find out where they're going? No what? On their phone? No? On their car GPS? Yeah. That's right. So we have to use maps sometimes to get places before there used to not be maps and cars on screens. And before that, people used an atlas or a map to get places. That's right. Some people still do. Yeah, that's right. Some people still use an atlas to get places. Well, one time when I first moved here, do you all know Aubrey? She sits on the front row. I first moved here, I moved down the street from her, and I asked her what church she went to, and she tried to explain it to me, but I was new here, so I didn't know where she went to church, and I thought, there's no way she goes to my church. And then one day I got to church here, and who did I see? Aubrey, and she went to my church. But we misunderstood the directions that she was trying to give me directions, I was trying to understand where she went to church, and I didn't get it. And sometimes people have to ask for directions. I'll get to you in a second, okay, Ivy? Okay. Sometimes we have to ask for help or directions. And there were these people when Jesus was born that had to go ask for directions. Do you know who these people are? Yes, neighbor. Close. That's okay. Joseph's already there with Jesus, but these people were trying to find Jesus too. And they're the wise men, the three wise men. And you know where they went first? They went to a king, to Herod, because that's where they thought Jesus was going to be born because he was a king too. But then they followed a sign. They followed a star. That was their direction instead of a map or an atlas. And they found Jesus, the king that they had been looking for. And so we are like these men like these people that are seeking after Jesus. And sometimes we have to ask for direction. Sometimes we use scripture to find Jesus. Sometimes we use our friends and family to help us to understand who Jesus is. And we get to help, we get to be people who seek Jesus, but also people who help others to find Jesus. Does that sound good? All right, will you say a prayer with me as we think about following after Jesus? Dear Lord Jesus, we seek you today because we want to worship you and crown you as our king. Amen. Okay, one more thing I want to tell you about these wise men is that we don't have them up there on the nativity set yet because they come later to visit Jesus. And so we celebrate this day called Epiphany, which will be in a few days where they make it to Jesus. So will you all help me get the wise men to Jesus over there? Okay, Ivy, come tell me what you want to tell me, and the rest of y'all come up here and grab a Bentley, (laughs) a wise man, and take it over to that table.
have to please stand and join us in singing Cornerstone, the words are in your bulletin. seems to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. My anchor holds within shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Christ first scripture reading this morning is from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, and verses 31 through 34. The days are sure to come, he says the Lord, where I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it, write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. 
And now if you'll please join in the congregational prayer for the Trinity Union Bulletin. Almighty God, you search our hearts and you see every part of us. All our desires are known to you, and from you no secrets are hidden. By the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, cleanse our hearts that we may be perfectly that we may perfectly love you and glorify your holy name. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Today, as we do remember that God makes covenants as with us, we also turn to um, the scriptures to the New Testament to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable undefiled and unfading kept in heaven for you who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time in this you rejoice even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials so that the genuineness of your faith being more precious than gold though perishable is tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> In Sunday school a few weeks ago in the class that I teach, we were wondering about what sort of contract the father of Mary would have made, Jesus' mother, would have made with Joseph's family, with Joseph's father. What sort of exchange would have been made when Joseph and Mary became engaged? In Mary's time, there was more than just a ring placed on a woman's hand to indicate that two people were promised to one another. <coughs> Instead, when the formal engagement was made, the father of the groom paid a certain sum to the father of the bride, which is called the bride price. This custom was instituted because the father of the bride was losing a daughter who was working for the family and in the family doing chores and hoping to make the family run. When she married, she would become part of and serve another family. And so this bride price was the father's a compensation for the father's loss. This exchange of money made that promise binding. Another ancient tradition signifying a covenant is something you may have seen at a wedding called the ritual of hand fasting. The hand fasting ceremony has its roots in the ancient Celtic tradition. In ancient Ireland, when two people chose to be married, they were brought together to have a braided cord or ribbon tied around their hands in the presence of a priest as they made their vows. The priest bound the couple together physically, while their words, their vows, bound them together spiritually. Today we have other symbols or rituals for making a commitment or a promise to someone, whether shaking hands, known colloquially as shaking on it, or doing the ever-important pinky promise when we were kids that bound us to everything forever and ever. Amen. Maybe there's also other ways that we sign contracts or make commitments to people. Maybe we say to someone, you know, my word is true and steadfast. And in that way, we make a covenant. When we look into the sky and see a rainbow, we are ever reminded of the covenant that God made with Noah and all of his people long ago and us as well. Our God is a covenant-making God one who comes into our lives to offer us unconditional love and unending grace. And God does this from the very beginning of our faith tradition when he makes a promise to Sarah and Abraham that they will be the ancestors of all God's people. Of course, like I mentioned, he does this with Noah and his family after a world-altering flood. God covenants with the Israelites that he led out of Egypt through Moses. 
Again and again, God shows up to remind us that we are his people and he is our God. And then we get to the prophet Jeremiah, who tells us that the day is coming when God will make a new covenant. This new covenant will be Christ, the one who reconciles us with God, who takes on our sin, who reminds us that nothing can separate us from God. But before that, when we meet Jeremiah making this prophecy, we hear that God and Jeremiah on God's behalf is frustrated with the Israelites, frustrated by their hard-heartedness, frustrated by their unwillingness to follow God. The Israelites have not held up their end of the bargain when it comes to faithful living. That covenant that God made with them on stone tablets, those Ten Commandments, they haven't been following again and again and again. Instead, they have given their loyalty to other gods. They followed their own egos rather than God's grace. They've forgotten not only about God's love, but also how to love one another. Of course, we too are like Israel. We at times have amnesia when it comes to God's goodness and grace. Other parts of our lives become idols. We begin to have faith in ourselves and our own knowledge. We don't really have the energy to love other people, especially those who aren't so easy to love. And so we come on this New Year's Day ready to receive God's love anew, just like the Israelites needed. A part of our history as Methodists is to focus on these means of grace or ways we can grow in our faith with God, both as individuals and in community. The means of grace are opportunities to see God's grace at work through prayer, through scripture reading, through communion, worship, and more. And as we begin a new year, it's appropriate for us to think not just about our New Year's resolutions and other parts of our lives, but think seriously about how we are going to grow in our faith, how we are going to recommit to God. What challenges and successes did we have in our faith last year, and how can we look more like Christ this year? How might we need to open our hearts up to God's movement in our lives? That's what today is going to be about as we participate in this service I mentioned called the Wesley Covenant Service. In 1775, John Wesley introduced this service as an important part of the spiritual life to Methodist societies, these groups that were meeting to gather together for worship. This renewal service was a time for Methodists to gather in self-examination, reflection, dedication, and they did it annually. It was through repentance, through confession and commitment to God that they humbled themselves before God, recommitting themselves to all that God called them to be. According to John Wesley's journals, though the covenant renewal service was held on various occasions throughout the year, depending on the society, by the end of Wesley's life, the service was offered on January 1st, typically, or the nearest Sunday to January 1st. The service that we're going to participate in together is not a contract in which God and human beings agree to provide some exchange to each other, right? We're not agreeing like, God, I'm finally going to be better. I promise I'll do these things, and you respond in some way. But instead, we are reminding ourselves that we are called to be in right relationship with God because God has already made that possible for us. The covenant is the means of grace by which we accept the relationship that God offers us and then seek to sustain it. It is therefore not so much about getting in a relationship with God, but staying in that relationship. It is about living in loving relationship with God. If God is committed to us, are we prepared to accept that as a reality and commit to God ourselves in return? Even if we do choose to accept it, how can we manage to live out our commitment adequately? Today you'll have the opportunity to make this covenant with God, and there's a space in your bulletin on the back for you to write and reflect on what sort of commitments you want to make to and with God this year. And throughout the rest of the service, we'll use the liturgy of Wesley's service to offer prayers of confession and hope and to receive communion. As we come to this communion table in just a little bit, 
We're reminded that communion represents this new covenant that God made with us through Christ. No longer do we have to wonder if separation from God is something that can be overcome. Instead, we have this promise that God is with us and in us through Christ, that God said yes to us before we even knew who God was, and that God sent his son to die for us so that we might live. We have this promise that God will write his words on our heart and that God will remember our sin no more. As you covenant with God today to grow in your faith, how might you represent that with a ritual like hand fasting or a pinky promise? Maybe we can't actually make a pinky promise with God, but is there a phrase or a prayer you can write on your bathroom mirror or on a sticky note to leave at the place you eat breakfast? Is there a habit or ritual you can add to your daily life that can help you to stick to your covenant with God? Or maybe someone can serve as an accountability partner for you as you enter into a covenant with God. I invite you to consider all of the ways God is already in your life, but asking you to take a step further. May God reside in your heart today. May you find a new place in your life to let Christ enter in so that you might be changed and transformed by the love of God and the promise of the Holy Spirit. Amen. At this time, we'll enter into this covenant service. You can see a little bit more detail about why we do this service. And you are invited as you feel led to respond when it says people. Brothers and sisters, the Christian life is a life found in Christ, redeemed from sin and consecrated to God. Jesus is the mediator of this covenant. He sealed it with his own blood so that it would last forever. On one side of this covenant stands God, who promises to give us new life in Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. Every day, God provides his goodness and grace to us, showing us that this promise stands, still stands. On the other side, we stand as those who promise to no longer live life for ourselves, but instead to only live for Jesus Christ, because he has loved us and given his life for us. There are times in our lives when it is important for us to remember and reaffirm our promises and vows. In the same way, we come today to renew our covenant with God. Many generations have done this before us. Today we make the covenant our own, renewing with both joy and sincerity the covenant that binds us all to God. First, we will spend some time confessing our sins and shortcomings, and then we will recommit ourselves to following Jesus with our hearts and our lives. We are those who seek to live as true disciples of Jesus Christ. But sometimes we fall short. Let us now examine ourselves before God, humbly confessing our sins and submitting our hearts so that we do not deceive ourselves and cut ourselves away from God. Let us pray together. Father God, you have set forth the way of life through your Son, Jesus Christ, whom you love dearly. We shamefully confess that we have been slow to learn of him and have been reluctant to follow him. You have spoken and called to us, but we have not listened. You have revealed your beauty to us, but we have been blind. You have stretched out your hands to us, to our friends, but we have passed them by. We have accepted your gifts and offered little thanks. We are unworthy of your unchanging love. Now I invite you to offer silent prayers after each petition. I will leave a time of silence. We now confess to you our sins. Please forgive us for the poverty of our worship. For the selfishness of our prayer. our inconsistency and unbelief. For the ways we neglect fellowship and your grace. For 
our hesitation to tell others about Christ. For the ways we deceive others. Let us pray together. Forgive us for when we waste time and when we misuse the gifts you have given us. Forgive us for when we have made excuses for the wrong things we have done and when we have purposefully avoided responsibility. Forgive us that we have been unwilling to overcome evil with good and that we have not been ready to carry our cross. Forgive us that we have not allowed your work, your love to work through us to help others and that we have not made their suffering our own. Forgive us for those times when instead of working for unity, we made it hard for others to live with us because of our lack of forgiveness, inconsiderate judgment, and quick criticism. Forgive us for when we have not tried to reconcile with others and when we have been slow to seek redemption. Forgive us also for these sins that we silently confess to you now. God, the Father of all mercies, is faithful to cleanse us from our sins and restore us to Christ's image. Praise and glory be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. At this time, I will share our joys and concerns for our faith community and our world, and then I'll invite you to join me in the Lord's Prayer. Um, Concerns include for Joe Thompson, who has a medical test at MD Anderson. Continued prayers for Bill and Julie Walker and for Gordon Higgins, who is still in the hospital. If you um, have questions about visiting either Bill and Julie or Gordon, please let me or Donna know, and we can get you the information. Um, Both Bill and Julie and Gordon would love to have visitors, so I'm happy to share that information with you. Um, Joy's Donna Nielsen and others in our congregation um, thank. uh, We had a secret Santa in our church who delivered gifts to people um, who have family far off or who um, live alone, and so we um, are thankful for that secret Santa who did that. And also, Barb's family is visiting, so they left, but they had been visiting, so um, prayers for all family who came or traveling we did during this holiday season and for safe return as well. As we lift up these prayers to join our voices in the prayer that our Savior taught us, as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us, gathered here before the Lord, now in covenant, commit ourselves to Christ as his servants. Let us give ourselves to him so that we may fully belong to him. Jesus Christ has left us with many services to be done. Some of these services are easy and honorable, but some are difficult and disgraceful. Some line up with our desires and interests, and others are contrary to both. In some, we please both Christ and ourselves, but then there are other works where we cannot please Christ except by denying ourselves. Jesus Christ, we offer you this prayer. Let me be your servant. Let me follow your commands. I will no longer follow my own desires. I give myself completely to your will. The power and strength to live as true servants is given to us in Christ. We accept the place and work that he gives us, acknowledging that he alone will be our reward. I am not my own. I am yours alone. Make me into what you will. Rank me with those you will. Put me to use for you. Put me to suffering for you. Let me be employed for you. Let me be laid aside for you. 
Let me be lifted high for you. Let me be brought low for you. Let me be full or let me be empty. Let me have all things or let me have nothing. With a willing heart, I freely give everything to your pleasure and disposal. Christ is Savior to those who are his true servants. He is the source of all salvation to those who obey. To be his servant is to consent fully to his will. Christ accepts nothing less. Christ will be all in all or he will be nothing. Though we have been unfaithful, God is always faithful. Though we are broken, God wants to heal us and make us whole. Through Jesus Christ, God offers to be your God again if you accept this gift of grace. I invite you to pray the bolded prayer silently now. Um, You can leave that to yourself silently, and then we will close in prayer together. The Almighty God searches and knows you, even the thoughts of your heart. Let us pray together. O God, you know that we have made this covenant today sincerely and honestly. If you find anything false in us, guide us and help us to set it right. From this day forward, I will look upon you as my God and Father. I will look to you as my Savior and Redeemer. From this day forward, I will look to you as my comforter and guide. O mighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you have now become my covenant friend. And I, through your infinite grace, have become your covenant servant. You are mine, and I am yours. So be it. May this covenant that I have made here on earth be ratified in heaven. Amen. Some of the prayer um, on this last page may sound familiar to you in that it's a contemporary version of the Wesley Covenant prayer that is in our hymnal, um, I think on 607 or 608, close to where we just sang a hymn, and that John Wesley wrote and that um, reminds us of the covenant we make with God. I have um, small print (laughs) if you want to take a card with you that has the Wesley Covenant prayer on it and the contemporary version there back in the back. I have a few large print bookmarks as well. If you want to take this with you, um, this is another way maybe to think about the covenant you make with God this year. You could have this prayer saved somewhere close to you where you see it every day and recite it to remind you of how we are called to be God's and to be God's gift. At this time, I invite our ushers to come forward as we give of our tithes and offerings. As we gather at the communion table, 
we're reminded that this is one way that God shows God's grace to us, that this bread and cup are an outward sign or a symbol of God's inward grace that is offered to us, that reminds us of our humanness, but also the great love that God offers us. Your responses are printed in the bulletin, and as we gather for communion, I want to remind you that this is not a United Methodist table, not my table, but God's table, a table that is open to all who love God or even those who want to love God. You are welcome here at this table. Let us join together in this great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Before the mountains were brought forth, or you had formed the earth from everlasting to everlasting, you alone are God. You created light out of darkness and brought forth life on earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. And when we turn away from you, Lord, your love remains steadfast. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn as we say, earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ, in whom you have revealed yourself, our life and our salvation. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he gathered with his friends in the upper room and he took bread and he gave thanks to God and he broke the bread. And he gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, and again he gave thanks to God. And he gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, on these gifts of bread and cup, Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, (coughs) sorry, by your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Those who are helping to serve communion come forward at this time and to remind you that if you need allergen-free communion, that will be in this center aisle for you. table is set, you are welcome to come and receive.
So teach my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way. And when I cannot stand, I'll call on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. And when I cannot stand, I'll call on you. Please stand and join me in singing um, our final song, The Wesley Prayer, Come Little Father.
I'm going to invite everyone to the back to the window, and we're going to grab some uh, grape juice and ginger ale.